Good afternoon, everybody. Today, we will be continuing with the classes in our Neuroanatomy series. And in today's class, we are going to see about the anatomy of cerebellum. We will quickly see the specific learning objectives of today's class. 1. Describe the external and the gross features of cerebellum. 2. Name the anatomical subdivisions. 3. Name the functional subdivisions. 4. Enumerate the deep nuclei of cerebellum. And 5. Describe the cerebellar penumbrils and enumerate the fibers in them. There are three more specific learning objectives that we will deal with briefly in today's class but will be taken in detail along with your physiology lectures on the cerebellum. These topics are to be integrated with physiology. So these are enumerate the afferent and efferent connections of cerebellum, understand the major functions of cerebellum and third one explain the anatomical and functional basis for the symptoms of cerebellar disease. As you know cerebellum is the largest part of the hindbrain and it is the second largest part of the brain next to the cerebrum. Actually the term cerebellum means mini brain and as we are already aware it occupies the posterior cranial fossa and is covered by the dural fold tendorium cerebelli which separates it from the occipital lobe of cerebral hemispheres. Functionally, cerebellum forms the central part of the major circuitry linking the sensory to the motor areas of cerebrae and in fact cerebellum plays a pivotal role in the coordination of fine movements. As you can see in this picture, the cerebellum lies behind the pons and the medulla and is separated by the cavity of the fourth ventricle from the The cerebellum consists of two cerebellar hemispheres which are united in the midline by the vermis. Now we are going to see the surfaces of the cerebellum. Cerebellum has got two surfaces as you can see here superior and inferior. If you note the superior surface, it is convex and here the two cerebellar hemispheres are continuous with each other on this surface. The inferior surface presents a deep median notch called as the bellicula which separates the two cerebellar hemispheres. So please note the presence of bellicula or the deep notch on the inferior surface of the cerebellum. Coming to the notches of the cerebellum, the anterior aspect of cerebellum is marked by the anterior cerebellar notch which accommodates the pons and the medulla. The posterior cerebellar notch is deep and narrow and lodges the fox cerebelli. Now we will see the fissures of cerebellum. The series of fissures are arranged parallel and subdivide the surface of the cerebellum into narrow leaf-like bands known as folia. Some fissures are deeper and help to divide the cerebellum into lobes and these fissures we will try to see in some detail. Coming to the major fissures of the cerebellum, the first one is the horizontal fissure which you can see here marks the junction between the superior and the inferior surfaces. The horizontal fissure marks the junction between the superior and the inferior surface. Next, you can see an important fissure on the superior surface. This is the primary fissure. As you can see here, it runs transversely across the superior surface. The two fissures you can see here, the horizontal fissure 
and the primary fissure. The third important fissure is the prostrolateral fissure which you can see on the inferior surface. The prostrolateral fissure separates the floblo nodular lobe from the rest of cerebellum. Tubervalis, the external features of cerebellum, it consists of three parts, the two cerebellar hemispheres united by the midline vermis. It has got two surfaces, the superior surface and inferior surface and three important fissures, the primary fissure and the horizontal fissure which you can see on the superior surface and the postrolateral fissure which can identify on the inferior surface. Anatomically, the cerebellum is divided into anterior lobe, posterior or middle lobe and floblo nodular lobe. So the anatomical subdivisions of the cerebellum are the anterior lobe, posterior or middle lobe and the floblo nodular lobe. Now we will try to see the locations of these three lobes. The anterior lobe lies on the superior surface anterior to the primary fissure. So the anterior lobe lies on the superior surface anterior to the primary fissure. The posterior or the middle lobe, which is the largest of the lobe, lies between the primary fissure and the posterolateral fissure on the inferior surface. And the floblo nodular lobe lies on the inferior surface anterior to the posterolateral fissure. So, once again to revise the anatomical subdivisions or lobes of the cerebellum, the anterior lobe lies in front of the primary fissure on the superior surface. The posterior or the middle lobe lies between the primary fissure and the posterolateral fissure and the floblo nodular lobe lies in front of the posterolateral fissure. Based on phylogenetic and functional criteria, cerebellum is further subdivided into three parts. These are archicerebellum, paleocerebellum and neocerebellum. So, the developmental of the functional subdivisions of cerebellum are archicerebellum, paleocerebellum and neocerebellum. We will see the functional subdivisions of the cerebellum briefly. The archicerebellum is developmentally the oldest part of cerebellum. It consists of the floculo nodular lobe and the lingula of the worms. And because its connections are mainly vestibular, it is also termed as the vestibular cerebellum. So this is the archicerebellum or vestibular cerebellum. The next part of the cerebellum to develop is the paleocerebellum. It consists of the anterior lobe except for the lingula of the vermis which was included in the archicerebellum and also includes the pyramid and the uvula of the inferior vermis because its connections are mainly to the spinal cord it is also termed as the spinocerebellum the third part is the neocerebellum the neocerebellum is the most recent part of cerebellum to develop and is also the most developed part and the predominant part of cerebellum in higher mammals. It is composed of the middle lobe or except the pyramid and the uvula of the inferior vermis. Its connections are cortico ponto cerebella. Coming to the internal structure of cerebellum, the cerebellum is made up of a thin surface layer of grey matter 
the cerebellar cortex and a central core of white matter. And embedded within the central core of white matter are masses of gray matter called intracerebellar nuclei. The cerebellar cortex is folded in such a way that the surface of the cerebellum presents a series of parallel transverse fissures and intervening narrow leaf-like bands called as folia. So the cerebellar cortex presents the fissures and the folia. The central core of white matter being arranged in the form of a branching pattern of a tree is called as arbor vitae cerebellae. Arbor vitae literally means the tree of life and embedded in this white matter are collections of gray matter called as intracerebellar nuclei. You have already studied the histology of cerebellum. Just to have a quick recap, it comes of three layers, the outer molecular layer, intermediate layer made up of protein cells and an inner granular layer. Now we will see about the intracerebellar nuclei. These are also called as the central nuclei or the deep nuclei of the cerebellum. As we learned already, these are masses of gray matter which lie embedded within the white matter core of cerebellum. On each side of the midline, there are four nuclei which are named lateral to medial, dentate, emboliform, globus and festigia. Once again, these nuclei are named lateral to medial as dentate, emboliform, globus and festigia. Because these nuclei are related to the roof of the fourth ventricle, they are also sometimes referred to as the roof nuclei. You may wonder why I am showing this peculiar picture or to make you more hungry? Not at all. This is just a uh, simple way to remember the arrangement of the deep cerebellar nuclei in order. Doctors eat good food. What do you make out from that? D stands for dentate, E stands for emboliform, G stands for globus, and F stands for festigium. So this is just the order of arrangement of the intracerebellar nuclei from lateral to medial. So once again, the intracerebellar nuclei from lateral to medial are the dentate, emboliform, globus and festigia. Hope you will remember this. Something more about the functional aspects of cerebellum. Of course, these will be dealt in detail during your physiology lectures on the cerebellum. We will briefly see the connections of the cerebellum. The archicerebellum or the vestibular cerebellum is predominantly related to the vestigial nucleus. It receives afferents, especially from the vestibular nuclei, and projects again to the vestibular nuclei of both sides. And because of these connections, it helps in the maintenance of the balance through the vestibular spinal tract, and it also coordinates the eye movements through the medial longitudinal fasciculus. Of course, you will be learning more about these tracks later on. The spinocerebellum is predominantly connected to the interposed nucleus. The interposed nucleus actually means the emboliform and the globus nuclei together. So the afferents of spinocerebellum are the spinocerebellar tracts and they mainly project to the contralateral 
reticular formation through the reticulospinal tract and helps in the maintenance of the posture and also in locomotion. And through its projections to the red nucleus, it helps in the motor learning. Coming to the most important neocerebellum. The nucleus of the neocerebellum is the dentate nucleus. The chief afferents are from the cerebral cortex via relay in the pondine nuclei, which you might have already seen. The efferents go to the opposite red nucleus and the ventrolateral nucleus of the thalamus and plays a most important role in muscle coordination and muscle tone. These functional subdivisions, the connections, you will be studying more in physiology. Now back to anatomy. We will briefly see about the cerebellar peduncles. So these are three important pairs of large white fiber tracts which connect the cerebellum to the different parts of brainstem. So you can see three cerebellar pedicles, superior, middle and inferior. The superior cerebellar pedicle connects the cerebellum with the midbrain. The middle cerebellar pedicle connects the cerebellum with the pons and the inferior cerebellar pedicle connects the cerebellum with the medulla. The details we will be discussing later on. A quick note on the blood supply of the cerebellum. The cerebellum is supplied by three major arteries. One, superior cerebellar artery. Two, anterior inferior cerebellar artery. And three, posterior inferior cerebellar artery. So three arteries give the blood supply to cerebellum, superior cerebellar, anterior inferior cerebellar and posterior inferior cerebellar. The details of these blood vessels we will be discussing along with the blood supply of brain. Hope you have enjoyed the small video clip and now we will go to see the important functions of cerebellum. Cerebellum plays a very crucial role in the control of voluntary movement. Cerebellum makes sure that all the voluntary activities or movements take place smoothly in the right direction and to the right extent. Another important function of the cerebellum is the coordination of voluntary movements. It plays a major role in coordinating not only the timing but also the force of the different muscle groups to produce fluid limb or body movements. As we have seen already, it plays an important role in the maintenance of balance and posture. Through its input from the vestibular receptors and also from the proprioceptors, it modulates commands to motor neurons to compensate for shifts in body position or changes in the load upon the muscles. So it maintains the balance and the posture. Another important function of cerebellum is termed as motor learning. It plays a major role in adapting and fine tuning motor programs to make accurate movements through a trial and error process. So this is termed as motor learning. Cerebellum is a major part of the brain that is responsible for what is called as a procedural memory. This is the memory that is needed for example to use a previously learned skill. It is very important for the acquisition and consolidation of motor memory. Now we will see some important symptoms of cerebellar disease. Of course, we will be dealing with this aspect more 
along with our BPL session on cerebellum. The midline lesions or the lesions of the vermis will typically produce trungal ataxia and nystagmus. Anterior lobe lesions will produce gait ataxia, whereas neocerebellar lesions will lead to incoordination of voluntary movements, intention tremor, and impairment of speech. Before we end, a small homework for you. Recently, brain scientists have identified one more normal function for the cerebellum. Can you just find it out? If you find it out, definitely let me know. So these are the important probable questions which you can get from the topic cerebellum. 1. Anatomical subdivisions. 2. Functional and physiological subdivisions. 3. Deep cerebellar nuclei. Histology of cerebellum. You already learned, so try to revise. You can do a small SDL on cerebellar pedangles and their fiber constituents. You name the three cerebellar pedangles and you have to name the fiber constituents of each one. And finally, the anatomical basis of cerebellar disease we will be dealing in our ABL classes.